Today's webinar topic, Title III of the ADA, Common Myths and Mix-Ups. And with us today is Nancy Horton. Nancy Horton is the Associate Director here at the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, but she has been training on uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act for since, since before it became a law. Um, something like that. And so uh, Nancy is actually going to go through and um, highlight some of the most common uh, questions that we get and misunderstandings that we get about the ADA. So Nancy, you want to take it from here? Thank you so much, Carlene, and welcome everyone to our session this afternoon. We hope that we're going to, you know, have some fun and, and learn something along the way as we maybe debunk a couple of common myths and, and uh, straighten out some mix-ups. So with that, um, before we really jump into Title III of the ADA and focus on Title III, we just thought we'd take this opportunity to sort of um, talk about a couple of the sort of big uh, overarching myths that we sometimes encounter about the ADA and sort of the primary one is that the ADA covers everything, covers the world. It covers, for example, private housing, airlines, the telephone companies, the federal government, foreign countries. And so this is really kind of a mixed bag of things. Um, so we're gonna unpack some of some of these things. So our first example, private housing. Um, generally, uh, title, title III does not cover residential housing. The only kind of housing that Title III would really cover would be if the housing were a uh, part of some sort of business that would be covered by Title III, like a private uh, college or university and that had dormitories or an assisted living facility where people receive services in addition to living there. Um, these kinds of private businesses, assuming they're not controlled by religious entities, would be covered by Title III as places of education or places of social service. So they're not just residences, but your typical private apartment complex and things of that nature a lot of that is covered by the Fair Housing Act, which is older than the ADA. Now, Title II of the ADA covers public housing that's provided by state and local governments, but Title III does not cover strictly private residential housing. Now, airlines, and another example, uh, the ADA does not cover airlines. The Air Carrier Access Act is older than the ADA, like the Fair Housing Act was already around and covering airlines uh, before the ADA came into being. Now, Title III of the ADA does cover private airports, covers them as commercial facilities, and Title III would cover any kinds of places of public accommodation like shops or restaurants located in airports, but doesn't cover airlines. Uh, now the telephone companies, that's another sort of uh, can of worms there because Title IV of the ADA does require telephone companies to provide various sorts of relay services that facilitate individuals with hearing or speech disabilities to be able to make phone calls on the network. But Title III nor the ADA does not cover telephone company uh, service, the telephone services or products bro more broadly. The Telecommunications Act, a very old law, <laughs> does um, address disability access issues to telephone services and products and equipment more broadly. Um, if a telephone company had a store, which many of them do, uh, the store would be covered by Title III. 
Um, but the telephone services in general and products in general, Title III does not address those. Now, um, our next example, the federal government, this is a common thing that we, that we find. Um, the ADA, Title V of the ADA covers the legislative branch of the federal government. That would be the US Congress, um, but it does not cover other parts of the federal government. It doesn't cover the executive or the judicial branches. Now the Rehabilitation Act, of 1973, so again, a law that existed in this case long before the ADA, uh, does cover the executive branch of the federal government. All those agencies from the Department of Agriculture all the way down to uh, Veterans Affairs and the Post Office and all of that is covered by the Rehabilitation Act. Um, there's no disability related civil rights law that covers the federal judiciary, federal courts. Now, our, our last example here, foreign countries, we, we do hear this occasionally that folks think that um, Title III or the ADA covers you know, private businesses in, in other countries, and, um, but it, it, it generally does not. Like most US laws, it's limited to the US. So that was a lot of um, detail that we sort of gave you an idea about some of the big things that we often find uh, people think are covered by the ADA and, and to what extent they are or are not. So now we want to just sort of run through on slide 13 uh, what is covered by the ADA. Hey, Nancy, hey, may, I, may I interrupt you just briefly before Absolutely. we move on? Um, so um, we did have a question about housing and what if someone's using, say, a Section 8 voucher or a HUD voucher and they're renting from a private landlord, then what, what covers that? Uh, that? That might be covered under the Rehabilitation Act because uh, HUD is a federal executive agency, Department of Housing and Urban Development. And in addition to covering the uh, executive agencies themselves, the Rehabilitation Act also covers any organization, entity, you know, state or local government agency or private business that gets uh, money, funding from the federal government. So I'm not that familiar with Section 8, um, on really what exactly what that is or how it works, um, but that might trigger coverage under the Rehabilitation Act. So back to our quick list, before we really jump into Title III, we want to make sure that everybody knows exactly what the ADA actually does cover. So first of all, Title I covers, any, covers employers, state and local government agencies, and private companies that have at least 15 employees. They are covered as employers. Title II of the ADA covers state and local government programs, services, and, and activities that they make available to the public. Now, Title III of the ADA, which is our focus today, and this is the um, this 28 CFR Part 36, that's the, the number of the regulations for, for Title III, 28, uh, the Code of Fe Federal Regulations, Part 36, that's where Title III lives. So Title III covers three big things. One is public accommodations. And public accommodations are private businesses that own or operate or lease or lease to a place of public accommodation. And pl these places include a wide variety of types of businesses that offer goods and services to the general public. It includes all kinds of uh, stores, offices of doctors and real estate agents and all kinds of professionals, restaurants, bars, theaters, banks, hotels, um, service businesses like gas stations and dry cleaners, fitness centers and amusement parks, all kinds of social service agencies like food banks and adoption agencies. Uh, private schools from 
preschools and daycares all the way to post-secondary institutions um, if they're private, not controlled by religious entities, um, would be covered under, under this part of Title III. Now, commercial facilities, the second category of things that are covered, uh, commercial facilities are private businesses that are not open to the public. They're generally places like factories, warehouses, uh, workplaces, essentially pe people go to work there, um, but they, they're not open to the public. So commercial facilities are only subject to the new construction and alteration requirements under Title III. They have no other obligations at all under Title III. Uh, because they have no customers. And the third category is, is people or businesses, private, private entities that offer courses or exams that are related to uh, applications, licensing, credentialing um, for things like uh, education, like post-secondary secondary or post-secondary education, professional purposes, trade purposes, so all the courses that you can take to prepare for all these examinations, things like the high stakes uh, tests that you take when you're in high school and the tests that you take to uh, pass the bar exam and you know, all of these kinds of things, any uh, exams that you have to take to get a license to be you know, a doctor or a plumber or what have you. All of those things that are operated offered by private entities are covered by Title III. So Title IV, we mentioned earlier, covers uh, telecommunications to a, in a very specific way, requires the provision of the relay services that facilitate uh, telephone calls for people with uh, certain types of disabilities. And then Title V is, is called miscellaneous. Miscellaneous provisions. It's the part I mentioned earlier, it covers Congress. This is where you find uh, the coverage of Congress is, is within Title V and some other interesting things that are in Title V. So that's what the ADA covers. I do see, I see we have a comment here that yeah. answers the question that somebody asked about Section 8. I, like I said, I didn't, don't know how Section 8 really really works. I, I understand it's a HUD program, but this commenter says uh, 504 would not be triggered uh, by the receipt of Section 8 vouchers. Uh, so there's your answer, folks. For that one, I, uh, I don't doubt that. So now moving on to slide 14, um, we're really going to jump into Title III now and really just talk about Title III. So our first up sort of myth that we encounter is that Title III somehow governs employment relationships if you work for uh, a public accommodation. You know, you work for a store or a restaurant or some private business that's covered by Title III, that somehow Title III governs that employment uh, relationship and a couple of the common examples of how this can play out for folks that we see is that folks think that if you know they work for a store or something then they can bring their service animal to work with them in the same way they would be able to bring that service animal into the store if they were a customer uh, and that's that's not the case uh, another very common thing we get a lot of calls about this is for workers who need accessible parking or reserved parking or parking near an entrance or something to get to work. And what we hear is that, well, my employer or well, my, the, the workplace here has the appropriate number of accessible parking spaces uh, required under the ADA standards and they all are the right the width and have the features and the signs and all of that is there. So we're, we're done with that. We're, we're good with that. But, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Title I of the ADA is what governs employment. 
So if that store or restaurant is covered as an employer, you know, they have 15 employees, then Title I governs that, governs that employment relationship. Uh, workers with disabilities are to be uh, accommodated on an individualized basis. So with the parking example, an employer might have to designate another accessible space or reserve, you know, more, more accessible spaces or reserve spaces for individual workers. A lot of people with disabilities um, don't really need accessible parking spaces. They need parking that's close, close to the entrance. They need to limit their distance. They're ambulatory, but they may have arthritis or a heart condition. And, you know, they may have an accessible parking permit, but what they really need to get to work is a parking place that's close enough so they can, they can get to work. So that's the takeaway here is Title III does not regulate the employment relationship. It's about the relationship between a public accommodation and, and the public. And, and similarly, the ADA standards for facilities, just like with the accessible parking, and this is true across the board, the ADA standards aren't in Title I. Title I doesn't have facility standards. So an individual worker with a disability might need a doorway widened to, to a wider width than what the ADA standards generally require just in, in a public facility. It's individualized in employment. So that's, that's one that we see, we get a lot of questions about. So on our next slide, this is another um, sort of common misunderstanding that we, that we see, is that a business is exempt if it's operated out of someone's private home. And the fact is, Title III covers home-based businesses. And this section number that you see here, this is a citation for, there's a section 36.207 in the regulations of Title III called you know, private businesses located in, in, in private residences. It's, it's a little paragraph just about this issue that says that um, home-based businesses are covered by Title III. Now there is a little, there's a small little exception um, in the definition of places of lodging, which are generally covered. There's a small exception for traditional sort of what we call bed and breakfasts where the proprietor lives in, in the facility, it's their residence, they live there, and they rent out no more than five rooms, no more than five rooms for hire. Those are exempt. But all kinds of other home-based businesses that are open to the public are covered. So if you operate a daycare center, um, the offices of lawyers or accountants, hairstylists, um, physical therapists, counselors, um, all kinds of home-based businesses are, are covered by Title III. Hey, Nancy, time for more interruptions. Sure. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we had a question come in, and I hope I'm understanding this. Um, would a school-sanctioned private after-school extra extracurricular club and I guess they're saying the club is private, but not the school um, that is, okay, run out of a school, an extracurricular club that is run out of a school responsible for adhering to ADA by providing accommodations to children with disabilities. That would probably take some unpacking. That might be what <laughs> you might want to call us. I mean, yeah. it's, it's possible that the, the club would be covered. It, it's Possible that it might not be covered, but there are a couple of things that might be relevant to look at. I mean, one th uh, one exemption in Title III um, is what we call for bona fide private membership clubs. These are exclusive clubs. They generally members control uh, the membership. They very often have substantial 
fees or, or dues to pay, their, their nonprofits, um, there's other factors to consider. Um, this sort of after school kind of, you know, or school related or something club probably, I would guess, does not fit that, does not fall, fall into that. Um, but the relationship, if we're talking about a public school, the relationship between the school and this club could be a factor um, where the school might actually have some responsibility. Uh, it depends. Sometimes these relationships between private and public entities can be a little hard to untangle. Sometimes we see these, you know, the private entities actually working under a contract with a public entity to provide some sort of a program or activity that the public entity would otherwise provide themselves, but they've hired someone to do it instead, a private business. And sometimes we just see these really, really close relationships between public and private entities. Um, so it's possible that either one, you know, either the club and or, and or the school might have some obligations in, in that kind of a program. But we'd probably have to know more. Yeah. Know more details. Uh, that's a good example of, well, we, we're often with these questions, we need more specifics. It isn't something where we can give you a quick yes or no, or a, um, you know, answer to it, because there are a lot of subtle things that can, um, you know, change it one way or the other. So that's why you call us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes we even have a hard time because yeah. sometimes we, you know, uh, people who contact us don't necessarily know all these details and some businesses, you can just go on their website and find all kinds of information that make it very clear right. who and what they are, and whether they're covered or whether they're exempt. And, and other times you can't find that kind of information easily, if at all. Um, but in any event, so moving along to our next myth on slide 16, this is something that we see a lot of confusion around and um, People sometimes think that mobile facilities are exempt or not covered um, by, by the ADA by, by, or by Title III specifically. And they are. Um, these uh, images here on this slide are just a couple of examples of mobile facilities. Um, the, the lower image is uh, it's basically a mobile little, little store, a little produce stand there. And it's up in a truck. And it's got a service window and it's got some shelves and things out here with some fruits and vegetables and things for sale. And the other image is, is again, a truck. Just happens to be another truck that's operating as a little boutique. It's got some clothing items and some jewelry and, you know, it's, it's basically a little store on wheels. So all of these kinds of things um, are covered by, by Title III. And there are other examples, um, you know, cruise ships is a big example. And we've seen a lot of uh, legal activity around cruise ships. You know, they sort of meet the definition of a place of public accommodation, typically in several ways. They got, it's a floating restaurant, theater, hotel, um, you know, all these things sort of rolled into one uh, floating restaurants. Uh, mobile health units, uh, the blood mobile, um, all these kinds of things would be would be covered. The Department of Justice considers these to be facilities, mobile facilities. The wrinkle here is that under Title III, we don't have standards like we have for a lot of buildings and other types of facilities. We have standards for vehicles, but that's when they're used for transportation. We don't really have standards for a, a rolling uh, restaurant. So that adds a little bit of a wrinkle, but it doesn't mean they're not covered. They still have other obligations. They can't discriminate in their services. They need to take steps to serve people with, with disabilities. Um, so it's, 
it's just something that we find, um, you know, again, sometimes a lack of awareness about. But, hey, Nancy, I thought, you know, I heard a business doesn't have to comply with the ADA if it, um, you know, has less than 15 employees. Well, that is another uh, another common myth, actually, that we that I did not include in today's presentation. But it is something that we have heard over the years. And that sort of is a mix up between Title One and Title Three. You have to have 15 okay. employees to be covered as an employer. But you don't have to have any employees to be covered under Title Three. If this little uh, boutique here in this truck is operated by a sole proprietor, it's still co it's covered by Title III, uh, which is again about the relationship with the public and the customers. So there's no there's nothing about how many employees uh, under Title III. That's that's not a factor. So. On slide 17, here's, here's another myth that is, is, does not want to die, is that religious entities are exempt from Title III unless their programs or activities are open to the general public. And the fact is, religious entities are very broadly exempt from Title III. This is a little different than the sort of the private clubs that we were talking a little bit uh, about a, a moment ago, where there are certain, certain types of private clubs are exempt from Title III, but not if they open up their activities to the general public. If a really truly bona fide private membership club holds an event, a fundraiser, a membership recruitment, you know, activity or so, anything that's open to the general public, then they lose their exemption, at least for that event, just for the purposes of that event. Um, but religious entities are just completely and totally exempt from Title III. They're, they're never covered in, in any way. And uh, this image here is just, this is a, um, a Catholic high school. It's just an example. Um, you don't have to be Catholic to go to this school, um, but it's, it's still not covered by Title III, and religious entities do a lot of things like this. They operate places that look like any other business, hospitals and social service agencies and all kinds of things, and they will not be covered by Title III. Sometimes um, religious entities that operate in hospitals or things like this receive federal funding, and that triggers the Rehabilitation Act, which has provisions and requirements very similar to the ADA, um, but it would not be it would not be the ADA. It would not be Title III because religious entities are exempt. So on slide eighteen, this is another sort of this is a double a double myth that we see coming from both sides. And you know, I've just phrased it as what we tend to hear. Well, I'm just the landlord. I'm in the building, but I am not operating that that business that's in there. So all of that has nothing to do with me or it's not our building. We just rent it. You know, we're operating our, our store or our the doctor's office or whatever here in this, but it's not our building. We just rent. So we don't have to do anything about, about title three. But the fact is by definition, Public accommodations include any private business that owns, operates, leases, or leases to a place of public accommodation. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier when I was talking about what Title III covers. And so this is very, you know, very clear that landlords and tenants are both covered by Title III. And this is a citation number for a section in, in uh, the Title III regulations that talks about that, 36.201 paragraph B. Now this is usually mostly relevant to structural access issues. 
Um, once in a while, we see a little bit of overlap when it comes to things like policies or more operational issues, operational procedures and things of that nature. But usually if there's a landlord and a tenant situation under Title III and they're both covered because they're both private businesses, you know, one's not a state or local government agency or a religious entity or something, but a, another private you know, business, one's renting, one's renting two. So they're both, they're both covered. And usually each of them has their own policies. Um, and so the other one is generally not going to be held accountable for something that's just the policy of one or the other. You know, if the tenant refuses to allow a person with a disability to enter their business um, because they just discriminating against them or they have a service animal or something of that nature. And that's just that one business, the tenant, that's their policy or that's the decision they're making or the mistake they might be making. Um, you know, the landlord had nothing to, to do with that. Now, if the landlord has a policy that no animal whatsoever of any kind or for any reason under any circumstances is allowed in that building, so the tenant is not going to be able to let in a customer with a service animal because the landlord won't let them, then the landlord is, is, is more implicated in that. But usually this issue is really about structural access um, and particularly improving structural access in older buildings, which we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Hey, Nancy, we got a yes. flurry of <laughs> questions that came in about religious exemption, religious coverage. So we okay. might want to dig a little bit more into that one. Um, we had um, so and let me make sure that that folks are understanding. So um, if a non-religious organization like a daycare rent space from the church, what applies? They they wouldn't be exempt in, in that case, correct? The religious entity would. The private business daycare center that's renting space on church property would not be exempt. They would be covered because if they're not a religious entity and they're renting space and operating a daycare center, then they're covered by Title III. But the religious entity remains exempt, even though they are a landlord. The, the, the exemption for religious entities is Again, extremely broad. It's it's complete. So, religious entities are never covered under Title III. They're covered under Title I, but not Title III. So what about religious schools? What about a, um, a private Catholic high school or exempt. a Catholic university? Exempt. If it's controlled by the Catholic Church, it's exempt under Title III. I what about little events at a church, like a, um, a graduation ceremony or a, a wedding, um, but it, they're not affiliated with the church at all? Well, you know, if if somebody, well, wedding is not a good example because a wedding is generally not open to the general public. It's mm -hmm. usually a private, you know, by invitation sort of event. It's, it's not a public event. Um, but if, you know, again, it's similar to the daycare ex example, if a private business, that's not a religious entity rents space on church uh, from a church or a religious entity, any religious entity and, and, and proceeds to operate a place of public accommodation, even for a day could be, you know, a festival or, or something like that. Then, you know, the private entity, that's not a religious you know, that's not religious will, will be covered. The religious entity will not be. And any of those types of activities, you know, the fall festival, the graduation ceremony for yeah, Our Lady, uh, you know, Catholic high school or whatever, those are activities of the religiously controlled school, whatever, all exempt. If the, you know, if it's, if the entity that's doing it is religious, it's exempt from Title III. And 
And here's a good one right now. It's very timely. What about a polling location in, say, a church or a synagogue? Oh, that's a great question. That's very different because that activity, the activity of voting would be covered by Title II of the ADA because private entities don't operate polling places, right? Pub public entities do. States, counties, you know, so forth. That um, We've got a million and one polling places all across the country, and many of them are in uh, religious, uh, you know, in churches and religious uh, buildings. Mine is my polling place is in a in a church. So again, the religious entity not covered, but the voting is because it's it's a public activity that's usually um, operated by a state or local government, which is covered under under Title II of the ADA. So the public entity has some obligations to do maybe a variety of things to make sure that people with disabilities can vote. It might be anything ranging from reassigning a person to a different polling place that's very near and similarly convenient and everything that is accessible um, to uh, implementing some temporary accessibility uh, features for election day, you know, temporary ramps or temporary designated accessible parking places or things so that people can vote. That's the responsibility of, of the public entity. Thank you. Thank you. That's so great. I, yeah, I hope we sort of sorted out some of those things. Just remember that when title three religious entities, never the twain shall meet. Gotcha. Now here's another uh, common thing that we've heard over the years in that the, the ADA always overrides state or local law. It's a federal law, the ADA. So it always is gonna take precedence over state or local law. But the fact is state or local laws that provide better protection or greater remedies will override the ADA. Even if it's just in one particular provision of, of that law, you know, individuals with uh, disabilities basically are supposed to get the best of both worlds or the best of all worlds. You get the best protection or the best benefit um, that's available to you under whatever laws apply to a situation. Um, now, Carlene came up with a great example of this earlier when we were chatting about this, um, this issue is that, and, and this, this image that I have on this slide here of all these dogs wearing all, they all have the same harness pack sort of things on them, all these handsome dogs lined up in a row. Um, and so what I'm illustrating there is these are service dogs in training. They're clearly still in class. <laughs> they're not fully trained yet. And they're not assigned yet or paired yet with the individual person with a disability that they will be uh, providing service to, working for. But a really common law that we hear about that many, many states have is that they extend uh, protections and rights to people who are training service dogs. They don't even have to necessarily be people with disabilities. They can just be anybody who's training a service dog to serve people with disabilities. And they're allowed to take the dog in training into stores and public places and everything so that they can be trained to do what they do and to be in these public places and behave appropriately. And so that's a common law that a lot of states have. The ADA doesn't require that. Title III only requires businesses to allow people with disabilities to, to come into most areas of businesses um, if they are trained, trained service dogs. Um, does, if you're just training a dog to be a service dog, the Title III doesn't 
doesn't have any, doesn't help you with that, doesn't have anything to say about that. So if you live in a state that has a law that extends some some rights to service dog trainers and, and you're training a service dog, whether you have a disability or not, you can take advantage of that, of that law. And now the flip side is that there are several states um, that have laws that say if you're going to use a service dog, fully trained, it's a service dog, but to be able to take it in public places, you have to have a certain colored leash on it or something like that. Title three doesn't say that, doesn't require that a service dog, you know, have a certain color leash or a vest or any of these kinds of things. You can use that if you want to, but you don't have to have that. So in that case, for that particular piece, in that state, you could bring your service dog into a place of business with a different colored leash, or maybe no leash at all, if the leash would interfere with the, uh, with the dog's ability to do its, its work. So there's sort of an example of where we would have conflicting laws, and the individual gets to use the one that's better for them. Here's a good one. I'm, I'm, you know, frantically screening. We've had a lot of questions come through, which is great. We really appreciate it. Here's a good one. Um, does the ADA override state or local laws that conflict, say, with local health codes? And this was a question we got a lot with um, the uh, during the pandemic with face coverings. How how does health code and health and safety interact with ADA requirements? Well, uh, and we, we, we talked about these kinds of issues a lot during, during the pandemic, Carlene, mm -hmm. as you recall, okay. um, and, and, and we still are. Um, you know, the ADA requires that uh, covered entities covered under both titles two and three, state and local governments and private businesses that we're talking about today, make reasonable modifications in their policies, rules, practices, all of that sort of thing. But reasonable being really an operative word there. So a lot of times health uh, requirements that are related to health or safety um, can't be modified. Uh, or, or it might limit in what ways they could be modified. Um, we saw a lot of debate um, and things uh, about things like the mask requirement during uh, the real heyday of the pandemic when there were mask requirements far and wide. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, and we even saw some cases in, in courts, mm -hmm. and for the, for the most part, those, those rules saying you have to wear a mask or face covering were upheld as being very valid, legitimate, necessary rules related to public health and, and safety. And so they couldn't necessarily be completely waived for people with disabilities who might have disability related needs to either not wear a mask themselves because they had a disability that made that difficult or impossible for them to do, or to have other people take off their masks because, for example, say I'm hard of hearing and I really need to see your lips and more of your face to be able to really communicate effectively. So I want you to take off your mask when I'm, you know, in, interacting with you at the store or the doctor's office. And so we saw a lot of uh, sort of compromise modifications about those things. We saw people using whiteboards and writing notes and everything instead of taking their masks off to be able to communicate with each other better. Um, and, and we saw sometimes we saw barriers and social distancing being being used um, to accommodate people who maybe couldn't couldn't wear masks. But there were times when you know masks masks had to be worn. So so many things throughout the ADA and in all the titles, including Title III, are often about finding the balance 
between the needs of people with disabilities right. and, and the, and the rights of people with disabilities to have access and to be included and, and, and other people's rights, um, especially when it comes to health and safety issues. And so I hope that that's, that's helpful. And one um, of the yeah. things we um, reinforce all the time is, you know, the ADA is, is not a law designed to provide greater benefit to people with disabilities. It's to level the playing field so that everybody, people with disabilities included, have equal access. Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of other limitations in the ADA and in Title III. There are limitations that have to do with all kinds of uh, difficulties and costs and and. And, uh, and again, the concept of leveling the playing field and, and, and providing equal opportunity, something that I often uh, say, uh, particularly in, in certain situations are, you know, the ADA is not, not designed or nor intended to guarantee success. It's intended to guarantee an opportunity. Right. So sometimes we do, we do have some, some compromises about that. Um, but let me, let me move along. We, we don't have, we, we're, uh, we do want to get through our material, but I don't, we have, we're going to have time for, for plenty of questions. I think we want to touch on a few things because we tend to see a lot of uh, misunderstandings, uh, in some cases about facility access. It's the source of a lot of, uh, confusion sometimes. So one, one common myth that we, that we hear about, and then we have from day one is if there are no standards for a specific type of uh, facility or element, uh, then there's, there's no requirement to make it accessible. And, and that's really not, not the case. Um, the Department of Justice has always said that if there are no standards for a particular type of facility, then standards should be applied. And this is a quote from some of their their guidance uh, material, standards should be applied to the extent possible. And again, cruise ships are a good example of this. Um, you know, we don't have standards for cruise ships specifically. But what we do have are a lot of standards for things that are similar. Um, you know, the, we have standards for restaurants and hotels and places of entertainment and all these kinds of things that can be applied to some extent within a cruise ship. We may have to think a little more creatively for other issues in a cruise ship because there are parts of ships that, you know, they're not like, it's not like a building. It's not a building. It's a ship. So we have to be uh, a little bit creative sometimes. And so the Department of Justice has done a lot of work around these issues over the years in, in a number of different ways, including, and I've, I've got this other little point here on this slide that I've called relate, a related issue, because we see similar uh, conversations about equipment and furnishings, which technically aren't covered by the standards because they're not Built part of the building. They're not fixed to a structure or built in. They're just, you know, it's, a, it's furniture. It's, it's a piece of equipment. It's a freestanding thing. And we see the same sort of conversations around technologies that businesses uh, often use basically to provide goods and services to the public or to interact with the public. I mean, especially these days, websites and online forums and virtual classrooms and all these things. And the Department of Justice has always said, you know, again, if there's no standard, it doesn't mean that you don't have an obligation to try to make that those goods available or that service accessible um, to people with with disabilities. So they tell us, you know, look for something similar. You know, again, like with the cruise ship example, if you've got an elevated, you know, a stage or something that's elevated, um, you know, uh, if that were a, in a building, 
we know how to make that accessible. We build a ramp to it, right? So we can apply things in a kind of common sense way when we see things that are similar. And the department does that with equipment and furniture as well. Um, when they review, do compliance reviews and investigations and you know, if there's a freestanding ATM machine or a vending machine or something, it's not fixed to the building, it's not built in but they look at it in the same way that they would look at it if it were built in. Could someone using a wheelchair approach it, reach what they need to reach and use that piece of equipment? Um, it's, it's really about being practical. And they, you know, they, they, they tell us to follow uh, standards under other laws or voluntary guidance that might be available. Um, the Access Board has all kinds of, the U.S. Access Board has all kinds of guidelines in development. Mm -hmm. They have guidelines for, for vessels. We have guidelines for um, other things that aren't standards yet. We have guidelines for a lot of outdoor type of areas, picnic tables and things of that nature. They're not standards yet, but they are guidelines. So there's something to go by, you know, what would accessibility look like at a, for an element like this or in an environment like this? So um, this is sort of a myth that, you know, if there aren't any standards, we can ignore accessibility. So the takeaway is don't do that. Don't <laughs> ignore the concept of accessibility. Um, think about it. Think about including people with disabilities and Look for look for the guidance that's available and try to make things accessible. So and on our next slide, coming down the pipeline are the uh, there are going to be standards for uh, website, uh, right? So there could be there could be someday. Hopefully, the hopefully, yes, there. Yes, and, and again, yeah. the Department of Justice has entered many settlement agreements with businesses. Um, which require the, the entity to use the, the web content accessibility guidelines, the, the WCAG. Um, it's, a, it's a common, uh, it's a voluntary uh, standard, um, very detailed, tells you how to make things like websites, web pages, and web forms, and all those things accessible. And they've entered many settlement agreements where they've used that as a sort of a, a measuring stick, if you will. For accessibility. So that's a great, that's a great example. At 21, this is another common myth that we that we find, or perhaps just a little known <laughs> uh, tidbit here, and that is that temporary facilities are, are not covered by Title III. But they are. The fact is temporary facilities are covered. And in fact, there is a section in the ADA standards for accessible design. 201.3, which says that in plain language, these standards for facilities cover permanent and temporary facilities. So these couple of images I have on this slide um, are just, you know, examples of temporary facilities. And there are lots of other examples, but this uh, slide on the bottom here is a farmer's market. And it looks pretty accessible. It looks like it's on some sort of a, maybe a parking lot or a relative a surface that looks like it's relatively firm and stable and, and accessible. And all those tables and things that uh, can be approached and people with disabilities could, could come and do business here. And then this top image is something that we have seen a lot more of in recent years, particularly with the pandemic, but not only because of the pandemic or limited to that, but this so-called pop-up facilities, pop-up stores and pop-up uh, restaurants and, and things. They're covered by Title III of all these little stores here. They're, they, you know, they're operated by private businesses, presumably. They're covered by Title III. And something that you can probably notice in this image, if you can see it, is that what looks like the entrances to all of these little temporary uh, stores here, although that, they look pretty substantial, but still they're they're temporary. Um, there's a little step. There's a little little step to every entrance. It's not accessible. 
So I don't know if there's an accessible entrance around the side or anything, but it kind of looks like these are the main entrances. All these little pop-up places are kind of facing each other and there's a little route, nice little pedestrian area down between them. And it, it looks at a glance like they're not accessible. And so that could, that could be a problem under, under Title III because temporary facilities are covered. Now on slide 22, this is another area where we see some, some confusion and even some misunderstanding. Um, folks sometimes think that historic facilities are exempt from Title III. They are not, they are covered. If a business is operating a shop or something in a historic facility, it is covered, it's not exempt, however, there are some additional considerations when we look at uh, improving structural access in historic facilities. We never want to threaten or destroy historically significant features of historic properties. And so the first thing I always like to tell folks when they're looking at a historic property is you, you need to first find out and figure out and understand what is historic about the building or the property? What makes it historic? There are lots of things that make a place historic. It might be something really that's about the building, who designed it, what it's made out of, the craftsmanship. Um, uh, it might be what happened there. You know, the old stand, George Washington slept here. It's not really about the building. It's what happened there. So it becomes part of that place. So you really need to understand what's historic about a property to begin with. But um, being creative uh, can really enhance access and still preserve historic significance and character. The character of a property is, is really important. So on, on slide 23 and uh, next couple of slides, I just like to share this little example because I think it's just a cool example of exactly that concept, what some folks did to improve accessibility at a historic facility. This facility here is a library. It's historic. If you can see the pictures, you can see that it has this little vestibule in front it's got a front door and it's got uh, three, four steps to go up to that door. Now the building itself was designated as historic, but the vestibule is not. It was added later to give folks a little way to get in and out of the weather and you know, get their coats off and so forth. It's a vestibule, right? But it's not accessible. It was added long ago, but it's not historic itself. There's no other way into, into this building, no accessible route to get into this building. And on this, the image on the right, you, you're looking at the same vestibule, but you're looking at it from the side and you'll see that um, on this side of the vestibule, there's a window. So on the next slide, here's a collection of some pictures of what they did. Over on the left, you still see that same uh, shot of the side of that vestibule where the window was. And in the shot next to that, you'll see what they did there. They replaced the window with a door, painted it the same color as the front door, built a ramp going up to that door from the side. They used the space there in the flower bed that was there to run that ramp up the side of the building up to that new door there. They used some red brick, on the side, which was which is the material that's at the at the base of the, the existing structure, was red brick. They added some handrails, which are compliant and safe. But yet, you may notice that in that near handrail, you can maybe see the detail of the balusters on that handrail. They are each, every other one is a twisted iron design, which matches the balusters on the original handrails on the stairs there, made them the same color. So they really made this look like it didn't just land from outer space. It's integrated with the property. It preserves the, 
the look and the character of the property. And something, and you'll see, you'll notice that there in the, the third shot over there, you see that there's a stairway that comes from the street down to the level of the, um, the bottom of the, the stairs and the bottom of the, the ramp there. Um, there used, the stairs were there before, but the handrails that were on those stairs were completely out of character with the property. They were big, rough lumber handrails like you would maybe see on a boardwalk at the beach or something. They're very much out of character with the property. So they replaced those with handrails that match the new ones on the ramp. So it looks much more in character with the property. And in the, uh, in the image on the right, if you, you may be able to see at the foot of that ramp in that third shot that we're looking at, you're probably saying, well, that looks like a little step there at the bottom of the ramp. How can that be? What good is that? You can't have a step to get on the ramp. Well, the reason that is there is because that's not the way you get on the ramp. You get on the ramp from the backside because there's no parking at this facility. You have to park on the street if you're arriving by car. So what they did, you'll see in the, the image that's all the way on the right, is the ramp leading from the back of the landing out to the street behind the structure where they created a new curb ramp and a new pathway, which they also used some of the similar surface stone material that we already existed on the front of the property to match. So the ramp itself is brushed concrete. Some of the walkway has some of the stone, again, keeping the character of the property. And they put some signs out by this new curb ramp indicating this is the way to go to get to the accessible route to get to the entrance, the accessible entrance. So people can, can see that this is where you go to get on the ramp. Hey, so I just- Nancy, quick interruption. What's, this is a library in Montgomery County, Maryland, correct? Yes, it What's is. What's the name of the library? It's the, it's the, I believe it's the Noise Children's Library. Okay. And our good, our, I think that's N-O-Y-E-S, I, I okay. believe. And our good friends in, in Montgomery County, where our, our main office uh, for the, the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center's main office is located in, in Montgomery County. And our friends at, at the county uh, shared these images with us when they did this project. And I like to sometimes share these with folks because I think it's just a good illustration of how they worked really hard. They put a lot of thought into it to come up with a plan that got access into this library for children and families and who knows, maybe employees as well in the bargain um, without sacrificing really the character of, of the property. So um, it, it, it might not be perfect, but it's a good example of what really can be done if you put some, put some thought into it. So jumping back to some more myths about existing facilities, we're really talking about existing facilities here because the way Title III addresses existing facilities is, is pretty unique. It's a very unique and it's different from Title II. But this is another myth that refuses to die. And it's, it's what I've called here, the grandfather clause and its opposite, because we hear it both ways. We hear that any facility that was built before 1990, before the ADA became effective, which was in the early nineties when Title III went into effect, anything built before that is just exempt. It's grandfathered in, don't have to do anything. And then we hear also people who think that every existing structure must be made fully accessible, complying with all modern standards, just as if it were built, you know, last year. So neither one of those is really accurate. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a balance that we're aiming for here. This, is, this readily achievable barrier removal is sort of the shorthand that we use for this unique obligation in Title III 
that um, places of public accommodation need to improve accessibility in existing facilities that are not, not being altered. They're just standing there. You're just operating your store or your office or whatever. And, but you have to try to improve accessibility in that, in that facility over time. Now, this, this applies to places of public accommodation only. It does not apply to commercial facilities. Remember, I mentioned commercial facilities only have to comply with new construction and alterations requirements. Alterations are different from barrier removal. Alterations are things that you plan just to renovate or, you know, things of that nature. It's just something you're planning to do. Whereas barrier removal is something you do specifically and solely to improve accessibility. So this is an obligation that public accommodations have. So what does that mean? We're just gonna talk a little bit about what the readily achievable barrier removal really means. This is sort of the definition of readily achievable. It's something that can be, that's easily accomplishable and able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. Gives us a little guidance there. And we have some things that we're supposed to consider. We consider the nature and the cost of the action needed. We consider the overall financial resources of the site or the sites involved. Sometimes businesses have you know, a parent company or they're part of a chain or something and they have access to larger resources. The impact of, of the action on the resources and the operation of the business and safety. We consider those things when we look at what is going to be readily achievable. So this is something that's going to be different. It's going to be different from one place to another, from one business to another, depending on their, their resources. And it, it's something that allows us to consider cost as well as existing structural or site conditions. Again, different from alterations. So on slide 27, we also are given some priorities, suggested priorities for when we're engaging in this barrier removal over time. Priority one is getting in, getting into the place. So that might involve exterior stuff, the entrance, Number two is accessing the goods and services, being able to get what you go there to get. Number three is restrooms, it, it, assuming there are any that are available. Some places don't provide restrooms and they're not required to by Title III, but if they're there, they, they should be accessible if they can be. And number four, anything else, any other things that you might have. If you've got things like drinking fountains or something, if you're providing that, then that, that would be in that other category. So on slide 28, and I always like to remind folks, this again is a requirement under Title III. When it's not readily achievable to remove barriers or to remove them now, then you need to consider alternatives like delivering your goods and services at alternative uh, locations or uh, you know, you know, providing curb service or something. This is something we saw just explode during the pandemic, right? Everybody's doing pickup and curb service and all that kind of stuff these days, sometimes just anyway, as part of their part of their business. Sometimes you can relocate activities. You can assign a class to a different building or a different floor or something like that, an alternative accessible location. Sometimes you can just help people. You know, you can you can help somebody get an item off a high shelf that they can't reach in the grocery store or something like that. So if we can't remove barriers and sometimes we can't, we need to think about other ways to make our goods and services uh, available and accessible. And again, a reminder that this uh, barrier removal obligation is ongoing. Sometimes factors uh, about that affect what's readily achievable may change over time. Usually this is more about resources um, because usually the, the structural conditions or the site conditions are not gonna change over time. And, and sometimes it makes sense to complete projects in stages. Sometimes that's a good uh, business strategy for a couple of reasons, because it can maybe minimize dis disruption to your operations, and you might be able to maximize some tax incentives, which we're going to touch on just a little bit later. 
So here's another myth that we that we hear a lot of, and that is that whether you're talking about barrier removal or alterations, that people are afraid that if you change anything, if you touch anything, you make some, you know don't change the doorknob. Because then you're going to have to make the whole place fully accessible. If you touch anything, you're going to have to fix everything. And that's not true under Title III. I don't know if it's true under any building codes anywhere, but it's not true under, under Title III. Um, when you do alterations, and again, those are the planned activities that you're just renovating or doing an alteration, adding something. Those, those projects need to meet accessibility standards within the scope of that project to the greatest extent technically feasible. And that means you consider site and structural constraints of the existing site, the existing property. It's not a cost consideration. We can consider cost with barrier removal, but not with alterations. We can just consider the structure and the site. And, and many alterations do not trigger an obligation to do other work. To, you don't have to go fix everything in the building if you do one little, you know, alter one little thing, one little element or one room or one area. However, there is one fairly unique provision in the ADA standards that says if you alter an area that contains a primary function, an area that affects a primary function, then you're going to trigger a potential for an expanded scope of work. It's what we call, for shorthand, we call it the path of travel obligation. So if you alter a primary function area, you have to look at how would people get to that primary function area from your site arrival points. That might be parking, if you have parking, sidewalks, if there's a transit stop on the perimeter of your site, there's a passenger loading zone, you know, a drop-off place. How are people going to get from, from those points to that primary function area? You might have to do some things along that path. And there's this little uh, exception here. Um, if, you, if you do alterations to windows, hardware, controls, electrical outlets, and signage, those are not considered to be alterations that uh, affect a primary function area. So you don't have to kind of count those. So what is a primary function area on slide 31? These are, you know, the common sense thing is it's the places, it's the spaces where people do what they go there to do. So it's going to be, it's going to include both public areas and employee work areas because they both of them are, would be considered primary function areas. So for example, the dining room and the kitchen in a restaurant are both going to be primary function areas because that's where the employees work and that's where the customers dine and that's what people go to a restaurant to do. So those are primary function areas. There are some areas that are generally not uh, consider primary function areas, entrances, corridors, and hallways, uh, restrooms, except the exception to the exception is a uh, highway rest stop. And those are because that you do go there to go to the restroom, right? But in most facilities, the restroom, it's not a primary function area. Employee common areas like break rooms and locker rooms. Those are not primary function areas. That's not what employees go there to do. They go there to work. So the kitchen, yes. The break room, no. In, in new construction, or if you altered uh, an employee common area, it would have to be fully accessible, just like public areas. But if it's existing, it, it might not be accessible. So since it's not a primary function area, if you alter, let's say, taking keeping with our restaurant example, if you alter the dining room or the kitchen, you're going to make those alterations accessible in the kitchen. It's going to be a lesser level of access that you have to achieve because it's a work area and work areas don't have the same level of access as public areas or common areas. 
The break room, if you were building it new, again, would have to be accessible, but it's not a primary function area. So it's a little bit of a quirky uh, provision, but it's the only time under the ADA really that when you do some action, you know, to building, alteration, barrier removal, that sort of thing, when you do an alteration, this is the only time you trigger additional obligation to expand your scope of work, to do more than just what you're altering is, is this. And it's about the path of travel. It's about improving that, that route that people would take from site arrival to get there. The other limitation on this, this path of travel obligation is that you don't have to spend more than 20% of the amount of money that you spent altering that primary function area to improve the path of travel. So if you've got barriers on that path, you're gonna remove them uh, using that 20% of whatever you spent altering that primary function area, you're gonna to try to improve priorities. You should look at entrance, the route to the primary function area. And if there, and if you, all that's already accessible or you get that accessible and you still have some money left, you could look at improvements in the other elements that serve that primary function area like restrooms or telephones or drinking fountains, if, if they're there, if you have them. And this on slide 33 is another sort of exemption from this path of travel obligation. If you do barrier removal, again, those are structural things that you do with the sole purpose of improving access that does not trigger the path of travel obligation. It's just alterations. So and as we wrap up here, this is our final um, slide. This is just something that I like to remind folks of. Tax incentives, which is not a myth. It's true. There are tax incentives that some businesses may be able to uh, use to help offset some of the costs of improving accessibility to their facilities and or their services. The, there's a credit. Now only small businesses can use the, the credit, but that includes quite a lot of businesses. Small businesses include businesses that either had gross receipts of a million dollars or less in the previous tax year, or, and this is an or, they have uh, fewer than 30 full-time employees. So if you meet either one of those, you're a small business and you can use the credit for eligible expenses. It, it will offset some, uh, not all, but some part of eligible expenses. And examples of things that you could use it for are barrier removal. You can't use it for new construction or alterations because you have to make those things accessible anyway, but you can use it for barrier removal. You can use it for doing things like hiring qualified uh, interpreters or readers uh, you know, for people who are blind or have low vision or for producing accessible materials, like maybe uh, your menu in large print or, or something of that nature. You can use it for those kinds of expenses. It's not just about buildings and facilities. Now the deduction is about facilities uh, or vehicles. And this is a dollar for dollar deduction. It's $15,000. Um, you can take it for every dollar that you spend for removing barriers in either um, existing facilities, you know, again, barrier removal or vehicles. So like our little image here, if you have a hotel and you, you have a, a shuttle that runs people to the airport or whatever, and it's not accessible, you might be able to you know, get a lift on your, on your hotel shuttle or something to improve the, you know, the accessibility of your, of your service there. So we have a few minutes left for some questions. If we have any more questions. We do have some more. I'm just kind of responding quickly to a couple of things here. Um, uh, for anybody who um, you know missed the first part of this or just wants a chance to listen again, there will be an archive recording available. Um, it could be a week or two until it gets posted, but bear with us, it will be up and everybody who was uh, present today or anybody who registered will receive an email 
um, notifying when the archive is up. So um, how are we doing on time? Okay, we got about 10 minutes. All right. So um, let's see, first off, um, where did it go? Let me find it. Okay, so a couple of myths or a couple of things that I think people get confused about that weren't in your presentation, but I thought might be good to address. One is the question of automatic door buttons, door openers. Uh -huh. Can you tell us if that is a requirement? Generally, no. The ADA standards do not require the installation of automatic or power assisted doors, even in new construction. And that is a good common myth because a lot of people think, think that they do, but the ADA standards do not require that. Um, I think it might be arguable that there are some instances where they might be, if not required, quote unquote, required, um, might be a, a way to make an existing property accessible when certain other features that are that are required for accessible doors are just not available because of uh, the constraints of an existing property. You know, one common issue that we often see is doors that lack adequate maneuvering space, you know, clear space at and around the door, uh, particularly for people who use wheelchairs or walkers or things of that nature to be able to, you know, approach the door and position themselves in such a way that they can reach the hardware and pull it or push it and then, you know, maneuver and get through the door and everything. So sometimes I think, uh, you know, a power assist feature or something added to the door can be a way to fix that. If you can't get the space, it's just not there. That could be a, 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 an instance where I think that you, you might argue that, well, you got to do something here. And that might be a way to make that doorway more, more accessible. But generally, no, they're not just, they're not required. Another one. Um, hey, I go to buy a local Walmart and their, um, their uh, motorized carts are always broken down. Isn't that in, you know, isn't that a violation? No, it's, it's not. It's a customer service issue, perhaps. Um, but uh, this, Title III, uh, nor any part of the ADA, really requires businesses to provide uh, those carts or what, what Title III calls personal devices, uh, wheelchairs, scooters, the electric carts and all that. They're not required to provide them. They're sort of providing them as a way to make it easier for people to, to shop um, and you stay in there longer and you know, sp spend your money and everything as a, as a courtesy. But they're not required to provide them. And since they're not required to provide them, they're not required to maintain them. Title III has a requirement that we often call the maintenance requirement. And it says, you know, any features of uh, facilities that are required to be accessible, required to be there and be accessible, must be maintained. You know, and this is about keeping things in good repair, the elevators and, and keeping, uh, you know, when you shovel the snow up the sidewalk, you shovel the curb ramp and the ramp. And, you know, so it's that all of those kinds of maintenance issues, but it only applies to things that are actually required to be there as accessible features. There's no requirement that these mobility carts or devices be provided. It's just something that the store is choosing to do. So that's, that's not an ADA issue. I certainly think it's a customer service issue. I mean, if they're gonna provide them, maintain them, right? Sure. sure. <laughs> they're no good. They're, they're no good if they don't work. Kind of like elevators. <laughs> no good yeah, but elevators, work. Elevators, there's a requirement to maintain it. I mean, sure. again, there's allowance for temporary, uh, you know, interruptions in service. Thing, you know, things like elevators are going to break down. They're going to need to be repaired. And that's, that's understood and that's recognized. But there needs to be some, some action. And, and you know, you do, if, when the elevator breaks down, you don't just leave it that way. <laughs> you, you've got to 
get it repaired timely in a timely fashion. And we want to thank you for joining us as we wrap up here. Again, we are with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. You can reach us or your regional ADA Center if you're not in Delaware, the District of Columbia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, or West Virginia. Those that That's our service area. But if you call 800-949-4232, you will get other folks just like us. Yep. All of the other networks have equally knowledgeable um, people who are happy to help. And and they're in your time zone. Also great. Uh, (laughs) So, and for those of you who did send us a question and we didn't get to you, um, you know, we do have limited time, but um, please call us or email us. um, And we are happy to answer your questions. the, for somebody who said um, they wanted a repeat of where to send um, the continuing education code, you want to email that here, and I'll put it in the chat, um, ADA training at transcend.org. So if you can email that to us by basically Monday COV, um, it, it'll be a couple weeks before we get the, the certificates to you, but we will get them to you, we promise. Um, And um, I think that about covers it. Nancy, do we want to, let me see, anybody have any last minute burning questions? And while we we have a final minute or so here, I just want to make sure that we thank everyone for joining us today. I want to, I want to especially thank both Maynard and Carlene in our office for um, uh, helping me and supporting me and facilitating this session, our interpreters, Aaron and Karen, our captioner, uh, Karen, and and everybody, all of you who joined us today, I just really appreciate you all um, joining us. Absolutely. And before you sign off, um, we are going to have a fun little webinar in December, um, kind of doing it for the holidays. It is um, called, I think it's, uh, let's gather together. We're actually going to talk about ways to make your, um, you know, personal entertaining your home parties, you know, that kind of thing, more local events, um, accessible, just some tips on things that you can do to make your, your own events as a host, more welcoming. So we would love to see you. It's going to be a very casual conversation. So, um, that should be fun. Hope to see you. That will be on uh, December 7th from 2 to 2.30. So um, I think we're good. Nancy, thank you so much. As always, you are such a wealth of information. We really appreciate it. Um, And we thank everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time.